You should have seen his face. <laughs> Look, he's all eaten away. <laughs> Photographed him. Looks as though he died in some sensationally unpleasant. Good morning, Los Angeles. This is July 20th, 1968. You're listening to News Radio. The latest from Hollywood today, Jack P. Pierce, the legendary makeup artist, has died at the age of 79. Pierce was responsible for creating all the legendary horror characters at Universal Studios in the 1930s and 40s. Among his work are the famous images of the Frankenstein monster, the mummy, and the wolfman. In his heyday, Pierce was considered the top of his field. However, he had lost his popularity of late and had been living in virtual obscurity over the past several years. A funeral is scheduled for later this week. So many memories, so many years. I was famous once. Maybe I still am. I don't know. My name is Janos Pikulet. I was born in 1889 and came to this country with my family after the turn of the century. Not long after that, I changed my name to Jack Pierce. For over 50 years, I made my living in the movies, working on some of the biggest pictures of the time but that was a long, long time ago. I am most known for creating many of the famous monster characters in the classic universal horror movies of the 1930s and 40s. What you may not know is that I worked in the movie business for 20 years before we made those pictures. In 1910, I was an aspiring actor, working on any movie set in town that I can get on, get on to. I did it all. You know, uh, extra work, bit parts, featured player, you name it. Anything to get onto a picture. Even stunt work. <laughs> you know, there are some real advantages to being five foot six. <laughs> ah, then I met Harry Culver. What a character. He could talk his way into anything. He founded Culver City, and boy, did it grow fast. A man named Thomas Ince set up a big studio in Culver City, and for many years, all of the big pictures were made in Harry's empire. He seemed to like me, which meant that my job title could change in a lot. 1916, I made it to a place that I would call home for many years. Universal City, the greatest, biggest picture studio of them all. I was uh, introduced to the owner of the budding film factory, Mr. Carl Lennon. He was a uh, haberdasher in Chicago after coming from Germany, so we had some things in common. Mr. Lemley was many things, but no one could ever accuse him of not trying. If he thought his studio could get an edge, have an advantage, it didn't take long for him to tell you about it. I was building quite a portfolio. And I really saw myself as an actor. <laughs> well, by this time, I first started to create my own characters with the use of special materials. Even though we didn't know it then, actors who did their own makeup were the first makeup artists to work in motion pictures. A few more years down the road, I met someone around the studio who I had long heard about. It was a meeting that would change my life forever. His name was Lon Chaney. I learned a lot from Lon Chaney. Of course, he became one of Hollywood's top stars, and he did it by creating his own makeup and his own characters. By the early 1920s, I had what I felt to be one last shot at the starring role in pictures. I was turning 35 and had been in the acting game for almost 15 years. You get labeled in this town. It's pretty hard to crack it. And when you're going for the big one, the powers that be 
are going to have the last word. I soon learned that I was destined to work behind the camera. Well, then I met a man named Bill Fox, the founder of Fox Pictures. Though he wasn't interested in my acting skills, he liked the fact that uh, all of the images in my portfolio were characters that I created myself using techniques that I learned. I might not have been Fairbanks or Cheney, but people started to take note of my makeup talents. In 1926, I did a picture for Bill Fox using my makeup skills on another actor. Using a combination of hair and other materials, I made Jacques Lanier into a monkey man. Considering it was my first real makeup job, I was pretty uh, happy with how it came out, and uh, it did get me a lot of attention. The next year I was back at university, doing more assistant work when we heard the most remarkable news. Mr. Lemley named the person who we never expected as head of production at Universal City Studios, and he did it as a birthday present for his son. Enter Carl Lemley Jr. Junior Lemley, as we call him, was given free reign and senior, by Senior Lemley to make pictures right away. I could tell that we were in for an interesting journey. In three weeks, we started production on an epic version of Victor Hugo's The Man Who Laughs. Junior handpicked that novel himself. He also told us of the plans he had to make movies of all the classic horror novels, much to Senior's dismay. <laughs> but that wasn't even the best news for me. Junior immediately made me head of the makeup department at Universal Studios. Over 15 years in the business, and I now had a new career, right before my 40th birthday. I was excited about the potential of being head of the makeup depart department at Universal, but more so because of the passion and enthusiasm of Junior Lemley. For me, there couldn't be any better picture, first project, than The Man Who Laughs. The Man Who Laughs was a huge movie, the biggest yet in my career. To play the lead character, Junior got Conrad Veidt, a fellow German who had starred earlier in the cabinet of Dr. Caligari. We started to develop the character, and I designed a wicked grin and a foolish makeup for Gwynplaine, the tragic hero. All right, give me five more minutes. We got five minutes, Conrad. Open up. Junior decided to make a movie out of the novel Dracula, which had recently been performed on the New York stage as a play. What we didn't know was how we were going to do it or who was going to play Dracula. But I was excited and nervous at the same time. I knew that Dracula had to be something unforgettable. Well, unfortunately, after Bella was cast in the role, I soon learned that he wanted to do his own makeup, as he had done on the stage. But I was not about to tell him any different. Then, with Max Factor's organization, I designed a green, green uh, grease paint for him and created a widow's peak look for his hair, but I never touched him on that picture. Instead, I helped create the looks for Dracula's brides and Mina and Renfield and Van Helsing. Even though I was disappointed that I didn't get to work with Bella very much, we could all tell from the start that Dracula was going to be a hit. What we didn't know was that a big German guy named Papa Karl Freund would do the photography and take control of the picture. Universal opened Dracula just before Valentine's Day in 1931. Almost instantly, it was a smash success. It didn't take long for the Lemleys to decide that they wanted a follow-up horror film. Six months earlier, Junior had given me a copy of the book of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. First, Junior cast Bella Lugosi as Frankenstein's monster. I did a makeup test with screenwriter Robert Flory, who was the director of the film at the time. But 
Once Junior saw the test, he laughed. <laughs> he pointed at the screen and said, that doesn't look like Frankenstein's monster. It looks like Der Golem. <laughs> so, Bella left the picture, much to his delight. And Junior hired a British director who was already on the lot, James Whale. With Mr. Whale on board, we had our picture. The one problem was that we still had no monster. Junior Lemley had a definite idea about what he liked and what he didn't like. Then, just like a story from a movie itself, a most fortuitous occasion arrived, in of all places, at the Universal Commissary. One afternoon, no one could have possibly known then how that one day would change all of our lives forever. Horace Potter was one of the most decent people I ever met, and certainly my favorite actor to work with. He was absolutely perfect to play the Frankenstein monster. We worked for three hours every night for three weeks to develop the makeup. With layers of cotton, collodion, and spirit gum, I built up the head and covered it in a gray-green grease paint. For his clothes, I shortened the sleeves of his jacket and gave poor Boris a steel spine and struts under his pants legs. The boots were weighted and the body was padded. The outfit added 35 pounds to him and the whole appearance made him over seven and a half feet tall. That whole time, was magic, as we knew then that Boris was creating something very special, one for all time. Take care, Herr Frankenstein, take care. Shut out the light. Monster. Frankenstein pictures earned 90 million dollars in the theaters at a time when one million dollars was real money. Of course, Junior begged for an immediate follow-up and we were all with him this time. But only one film went into production from that period. The Mummy. I did two makeups for the picture. The one which was used for a large portion of the film was the Art of Bay makeup. That one was relatively simple, giving Boris the wrinkled appearance. But the complete Imhotep mummy makeup took eight hours to put on Boris, from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. Eight hours. And it was an hour and a half to take the whole thing off. His ability to bring my work to life is really what made those monsters unforgettable. Ah! The Mummy was one of my favorite characters and the only one to get me a Hollywood Filmograph Award before they gave Oscars to makeup people. And Boris Karloff himself presented me with the award. My next project was a very unique one with James Whale. It's easy, really, if you're clever. A few chemicals mixed together, that's all. And flesh and blood and bone just fade away. Oh! He's here! Invisible Man! Oh! I did many pictures, which included the universal group of actors from that time. Many of them had Boris Karloff, Bela Lugosi, or both. Uh, including the Black Cat, the Raven, and the Dizable Ray, Tower of London, and the Old Dark House. We really made some quality pictures back then. We finally did a werewolf picture, but it wasn't with Boris. This one, called Werewolf of London, starred Henry Hull. I had designed a complete wolf character for him, but Henry didn't want to wear makeup that fully covered his face. Then, finally, we were able to put together that we all called The Return of Frankenstein. It was one unlike anything that had been portrayed in motion pictures. She's alive! Alive! Thank you. 
Bride of Frankenstein. Stand back! Stand back! With James Whale and the Lemleys, we made the picture Showboat the next year. But word had gotten out that the Lemleys were in trouble. Though the studio had its share of pictures, they were strapped for cash. And Senior Lemley made a decision to sell the studio. It was the end of an era. With the Lemleys gone, none of us knew what was going to happen at the studio. The only thing we did know is that we would never make pictures like we had before. After the Lemleys left the studio, things immediately changed. I honed my beauty makeup craft on many leading ladies like Joan Fontaine and Susanna Foster. And I made up a dashing young man named Vincent Price in his first movie, Service Deluxe. But then, everything changed again. <laughs> in the summer of 1938, a movie theater in Hollywood started showing Dracula and Frankenstein on a double bill. Boy, did that get certain people's attention. The new studio head, Charles Rogers, said that we were going to do one more monster picture immediately. With the production nearing the start date, I was informed that the writers added a new character to this new monster script we were doing. Someone to help the new Dr. Frankenstein bring the monster back to life. I never could have guessed who they would have cast in the role, but Del. This time, he was more than happy to let me do my work. We got along famously and created what I believe to be his most finest character, Igor. We worked in record time to put together Igor, plus a new version of the monster, Vera West, who was my good friend and had been in the costume department head at the studio for as long as I had been there, designed that great shaggy coat that the monster wore in that picture. And that was shot at the end of 1938 to make it into theaters at the beginning of 39. Even the Lemleys never worked so fast. Although James Whale was no longer at the studio, the picture called Son of Frankenstein felt like a family reunion for all of us. and 1940s, the early 40s, we did 10 monster sequels. There was a Mummy sequel with Tom Tyler, and three others with Lon Chaney Jr. Then, Lon played the monster in Ghost of Frankenstein, and the Count in Son of Dracula. And there was Irving Pitchell, Dracula's daughter. I even made Bela Lugosi into the monster in Frankenstein Meets the Wolfman. Ah. <laughs> uh. We were going sequel crazy, often them punching them out as B pictures. Rumors circulated that we were going to do a picture long in the works. It was the one that I had first planned for Boris Karloff after we did The Mummy. Now we were going to try it again, but Boris, like me, was in his 50s by this time. I never could have imagined who I'd be working with in his place. I was tasked with working on Long Cheney Jr. to create The Wolfman. With the help of my assistant and friend, Abe Haberman, it took two and a half hours to apply this makeup. I laid all the yak hair on a little row at a time. After the hair is on, you curl it, and then you singe it and burn it to make it look like an animal that's been out in the woods and rubbing and all like that. The Wolfman was my favorite character since the mummy. Don't be startled, Sir John. You have the silver cane for protection.
Even though the B movies continued, we did get to make one or two A-list movies with some new characters. Or should I say some new versions of some favorite characters. First up was a big Technicolor remake of The Phantom of the Opera. Now this Phantom wasn't as spectacular as a silent version, as you call it today. But I liked the way that Claude Rains looked, as it was the only one of my monster characters to be filmed in color. In the war years, I was very busy with projects like a Man-Made Monster and The Mad Ghoul and two back-to-back -back films that included my old friends. We did House of Frankenstein, then House of Dracula with a new monster, this time played by regular Western film actor Glenn Strange. I also created a new mad scientist character played by Onslow Stevens for the second film. How are we to know then that we were doing the last of the great horror films? Both House of Frankenstein and House of Dracula were hits, but after the latter, in 1946, we found out that Universal was merging with an independent studio called International Pictures. We didn't know what that meant, but we had gotten pretty used to all the changes. However, in the mid-1940s, Carmen, Vera West, and I did all of our work with two of our favorite actors of the time. I want to know what's the fellow's name in left field. What is on second? I'm not asking you who's on second. Who's on third? I don't know. Third base. Though I had been head of the makeup department long before the boys got to the studio in 1941 and made buck privates, my first screen credit with them was in 1945 with the naughty 90s. That picture had the famous Who's on First routine, and we created a unique look for them in that scene. They used to tell me, Jack, one day we're going to do a show on stage, drag all your monster characters out, and do the funniest, scariest show of all time. On stage yet? I said to them, put that in the movie, and you got something. In the spring of 1947, we heard of an upcoming picture with Bud and Lou called The Brain of Frankenstein. At long last, after years of talk, the boys had talked the studio into making a script that had all of the classic horror characters. Sure, it was a comedy scenario with Bud and Lou, but the script called for a Dracula, a Frankenstein's monster, a wolfman, even an invisible man, and all like that. Then, right on the set, just as a director, Charlie Barton, was telling us about his plans for the picture, many of us were called into the office of William Getz, the new head of Universal International. We were excited. We thought that he was finally putting the brain of Frankenstein into production. However, it was not a day I look back on fondly. We people who worked for a long time at the studios had been warned about what was to occur we never thought would happen to us. I worked as head of this department for 19 years. I worked at the studio for 30 years. And I never signed a contract with him. For the next 15 years, I drifted around quite a bit. I did a TV show with Carmen DeRigo in 1955 called you are there. I did several movies in the 1950s and 1960s, like Teenage Monster, Beauty and the Beast, and Giant from the Unknown. But it wasn't the same. Then, 1961, I got a job from an old friend when Arthur Lubin hired me to work on my oddest job ever. <laughs> Hello, I'm Mr. Red. <laughs> I did makeup on Ed for three years. Though mostly on the actors, not the horse. <laughs> and it, it was my last job. I did get to make up my good friend Alan Young as an old man once in the show. I think that work was my last real challenge as a makeup artist. 
You know, I worked in the business until I was 75 years old. Ah, well, success teaches us nothing. But I know that I had a great career. They say that when I passed away in July of 1968, that I died in obscurity. They say that only 24 people came to my funeral. But I know, I know that there were others. There's his wife, Blanche. There, that's his friend Abe Huberman. Who are all the others? They are all here for a reason. Yes, there was only one Jack Pierce. <laughs> <laughs>